model would explore, would have us say that India and China would be really rich by the 1950s. That hasn't happened. Um, also, there's just capital in the equation. Well, what kind of capital is there? Housing, health care, education? That's going to have an impact on economic growth, but it just comes with the equation as capital. What the hell that is? Um, I guess they could go to the economics there. Um, it doesn't have um, anything about natural resources. I mean, if you're sitting on top of a gold mine, that probably has an impact on the wealth of the nation. Um, a bunch of assumptions that these ideas are true, and also, is there really such a thing as a capital formation or a saving rate in poor countries? If you're in a very, very poor country getting a dollar a day, you may not take your dollar and put it to invest in a factory. You might, you know, buy some food. Um, <laughs> that's going to throw off the numbers if we're talking about billions of people. So, basically, Kuznets raises a whole bunch of questions, saying that this model has some serious problems. Solo tries to fix it, and people after Solo try to fix the Solo one. Um, Solo would say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't fit my model for this government or, or legal thing. I'm not going to journey my hands with that. No, it, it'll all converge eventually. Well, that's not helpful if it's actually not happening. Um, people created what uh, a cost, or not cost, but an extra term called the Solo residual, basically explaining, trying to explain why it doesn't match the data. Um, I think that's bullshit. Uh, a lot of people do too. And also, none of these models really explain why we had economic growth in the beginning. So, we're going to take a quick look at that from an economic history standpoint. What happened in Europe? What happened in Asia? What happened in the Middle East? And then, uh, what kind of conclusions? But this is still the model we use. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The solo model is, is you know, the word go. Yes. So, when we calculate steady states money for the class, they're calculating the far future state at which the economies will all converge. converge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they didn't put it quite that way. You <laughs> <laughs> I mean, could look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, yes, I mean, the populations are going to be different. But yeah. if we assume, we assume that all capital is going to be equally productive in the world, um, eventually. We assume uh, population growth rate is going to be constant because everyone's equally educated. The, um, should be cost of children, uh, basically, uh, even now. You assume, um, you know, with, with those two assumptions, you're already assuming the table is constant. Um, yeah, so everyone meets in the middle. So you sort of, so you're sort of, when you calculate steady state, you're not calculating anything like that's going to go on tomorrow. No, next year, no, absolutely. Year. I mean, everyone has sort of theorized that there are steady states. Kuznets thought that. Even Smith thought there would be some sort of steady state. But he admits no one it. Just that says we probably haven't reached it. We definitely haven't reached any solo thing. We're still growing. Like our growth rate is definitely going to be else's. So, yeah. um, do a quick lesson in Dutch history, um, just trying to figure out what happened. Um, the first thing Dutch did um, after they got independence from Spain, they were following Spain. Um, a very brutal, um, nasty unit. Um, is there a bunch of changes to financial institutions and the way finance was done? Better records, double entry bookkeeping, um, and a whole bunch of economic tools that are still in use today. Um, it also really, really, uh, they created a, uh, a bank with uh, the stock market and all sorts of things that were really revolutionary at the time. Um, the Dutch also organized themselves into the system of Ultra Cool, which is a French fancy word for basically supply and demand. So they basically created nice niche markets. You know, when you go to New York or Chicago or anywhere, and you want to get some jewelry. Well, all the diamond merchants are sitting next to you. And all the KFC, you know, food is sitting next to you. It's, there's a sort of synergy between businesses that they didn't fully understand and they tried to help. Um, that if you have businesses in a particular sector together, they all work better. Um, so they, they basically put on the cloth trade. The Dutch did cloth and they did hair. And spices were nice. So they got all the cloth people working together using, still using the putting out system, which is basically, uh, you know, if I do medieval history, I show up at your door with a book bag of wool, and I say, by Friday, I want some cloth. And you get to do it however you want, you get paid, uh, I pay you based on how much cloth you get. Um, they did that on a massive scale, and it's basically a division of labor that's very, very productive without massive machines trying to stuff out. Um, the Dutch also developed a notion of property rights. 
run for it at the time. Like, this is my stuff. There isn't, since um, it's a republic, it's not a kingdom, the king can't come and take my stuff. I have legal rights protecting my stuff. Um, the notion of property rights, and later intellectual property rights, really encourages innovation. If I come up with a great new tool, and then the king just takes it, there's no incentive for me to come up with it to begin with, because I'm not going to get any profit from it. All the labor I went to developing it went to waste. Well, now if I can actually have well, a new device, and I can make money off of it, as we see in patents in a second, uh, I can actually make money from it. And it encourages me to do it. Thomas Edison would have thought that the light bulb if the US government said, OK, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to use all of it. Uh, this is actually just to show you the extent of uh, the Dutch trading. This is a Japanese print of a Dutch ship in Osaka Harbor. However, we noticed that the um, the British overtook the Dutch, and the simplest reason, which I know, but I probably don't want to hear, is the Dutch and the Brits fought for the um, Pretty much, I mean, the economic rationale was Holland imported wool from England, made it into cloth, and sold it back to England. And after a while, the British were like, "Wait a minute! I guess we can make the cloth ourselves." <laughs> um, you'd be surprised. Spain did that for like six hundred years. They never caught up. <laughs> um, and so they lost the, the world market. And the British basically, over three hundred years, fought them for all their colonial possessions over nutmeg and all these other spices. Kicked them out of New Amsterdam. Made them look. That's why they changed the night and sand. So. That's, that's my explanation for why the British took over. Uh, it's, there needs to be more evidence for that. So what else happened when they didn't get okay. So um, they adopt similar financial systems and social institutions um, as uh, Holland. They were very progressive uh, in that respect. The biggest thing which would have made a, a huge deal in my mind, different in my history class, is they extended for the first time in history property rights and intellectual property. They created patents. So if I come up with an idea, I have exclusive rights to it for X number of years. That's huge. Um, and that and the, the argument is without that, you never would have had the Industrial Revolution. And it's no coincidence that the Industrial Revolution starts in England because that's the place where patents are the norm. Um, you also have these very interesting <clears throat> legal cases known as the Taylor cases. Um, And there, sort of by common law, you get these notions of markets and um, trademark that become law eventually. So, for example, I'll tell you the case. One of them is I don't know what the old tailor. Um, this one tailor makes these really good quality shirts and puts a little mark on them to say, This is my good quality shirt. Well, the tailor down the road is like, Hey, you know, those shirts are selling for more. So he just starts putting this mark, uh, like, don't think like a Lacoste paint or a little branding. He starts copying that and puts it on the shirt. And the first dealer says, well, but that's my mark. The other one says, it's just a piece of cloth. And the court ruled that that mark was symbolizing the quality of his brand. And another tailor couldn't copy it. That's critical. That's critical today. Um, second case was one tailor um, decides to retire, so he sells his shop. Um, someone else buys it. But then the other tailor says, psych, opens up shop the next door. The other person sued and forced the first tailor out of business because part of that transaction was assumed was the cost of televisions, so protection of customers as a resource that belongs to someone. That's another very important concept today. So the, the argument is these these notions, these um, ideas were developed in England at this time. They were very important, and you couldn't have had the industrial revolution without them. Um, just going a little bit to two other examples. Basically, the arguments to why China in the Middle East is important. Because as we saw, they were in, in Jared Diamond's big circle, they were with Europe. They should, they have, also have pigs, they have meat, they have rice, they have all this stuff. Um, so, what does China have going for them? Well, it's an extremely large population. Um, and it's fairly technologically advanced. I mean, they have, um, they create paper, printing presses, um, earthquake device detector things, uh, all stuff you learned in sixth grade. Sort of made the economy a one trick pony. Everybody ate rice. They didn't try to develop any other crops. Um, they just copped out a lot of trees in the process. Um, very ill defined property rights. 